to welcome you to the JCU guest lecture for 2018. Um, the, this year's lecture is given by uh, Mr. Simon Harrison, who I'm sure everybody in this room will have met, or at least know of. Uh, Simon is a consultant, consultant neurologist at Pinderfields and Wakefield for, for almost 25 years, uh, and during his career he developed an a huge and uh, very complex uh, practice in neurological urology. Amongst his many achievements, he's been a, a council member for BAUS, who was the elected chair of the female section of urology, and also chaired the NICE um, guidelines on urinary incontinence in neurological disease. His current uh, and latest uh, role is that of the GERFT lead for urology, um, and it is in this guise that uh, Simon is going to speak this afternoon. It, uh, before I hand over to Simon, it reminds, I was reminded of a quote from a film, The War of the Roses, with um, Danny Zavito and Michael Douglas. Has anyone seen that film? No. You can put your hands up. No. It, it starts off with a quote of Danny Zavito. He's, he's sat across from his lawyer's desk, and he says, When a man who, offer, who earns $500 an hour wants to tell you something for free, you should listen. Likewise, when a man who is... is been to every urology unit in the country, wants to tell us something for free, we ought to be listening. So, Simon, over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ian. So, firstly, could I just say to Ian and the editorial team at the JCU how, uh, how much I appreciate being asked to, to talk uh, this afternoon and to give the, uh, the invited, invited lecture. It reminded me that the very first edition of the Precursor Journal, the Journal of Medical and Surgical Urology uh, had an article by S.C.W. Harrison looking at uh, the work of the increasing involvement in consultants in on-call work. So I'm nothing if not consistent. So let's talk about the Getting It Right First Time program. So it was a, it's been a journey for me and, and it started actually one Saturday morning over the toast and marmalade as I leafed through the BMJ as one does or did in my day and came across a, a, an advert for a clinical lead for an improvement project uh, funded by the Department of Health. So I made some inquiries and, and went down to be interviewed by Tim Briggs, who's, who's a, a force of nature, actually. He's an orthopedic surgeon who invented the Getting It Right First Time program and has driven it with enormous energy since. And it was explained to me that this is basically a very simple uh, idea, but a very powerful one. And the idea is that if you take all the information that you can gather that's out there in, in, in the digital world about a, a clinical service, and you put that together in a data pack where that service is benchmarked against the services of all the other trusts in the country, then you begin to see some very important and potentially interesting uh, differences and shifts. But the data pack asks questions, it doesn't answer them. So that the second part of the methodology is to send uh, a, a senior and aged clinician, in my case, to every trust in the country uh, to sit down with clinicians and executive level uh, directors to talk about the service and run through the data pack. So in the photograph there, you can see the start of my journey with the BMJ. You can see actually the end of that phase of the journey as Peter Stuart Sanderman, uh, my GERF colleague, and I completed our last of 134 visits at the Westmoreland General Hospital. So, how's it worked in, in urology? Well, the first thing is that there is actually quite a lot of data out there. So data availability, because it's a surgical specialty, is actually quite good. A lot of it's in HES, so you can argue about quality. A lot of it's in BAUS databases and registers, you can ask about quality. But there's also stuff on procurement, on litigation uh, out there as well. So the data pack is, is quite a big document, as you'll remember. We also did uh, some pre-visit questionnaires, which has provided further further um, useful insights. I must say the visits proved to be a really hugely enjoyable experience as I travelled around the country with my senior rail card. And the interaction with urologists and indeed with managers has uh, been universally good. There have been one or two ageing cynics out there, but, uh, but no animosity at all and a lot of openness and reflection, which I think is heartening. So drawing from all that experience, I hope trusts themselves have taken something away from those meetings, but we've also been able to put together a national report, and we've just got across the, the finish line with that, so that it's available on the BAUF members uh, section of their website, and you can spend a happy
couple of hours reading that tonight if you so wish. So we move on to the last phase, which is implementation, as we heard in the last session. That's maybe where some of the difficulties start. So the currency of, of GERFT, as I'm going to call it, is actually variation, and it's variation in clinical practice. So let's just pause for a moment to have a think about that. So if we measure an outcome uh, from some intervention or procedure or population, uh, we may get the yellow distribution there, a fairly broad-based uh, distribution, a lot of variation in there. And if we inquire about the, uh, those departments that are producing high-end uh, outcomes, good outcomes, in this case on the left-hand side of the distribution, and find out what they're doing. The principle is that if we then move that out and generalize it, we will do two things. We will shift the mean towards the, the uh, better end of practice, and we will also narrow the degree of variation. But of course, we won't get rid of variation altogether because it's a biological system that will have its own inevitable variation in there. It'll have appropriate variation because if you're dealing with an older population down in Truro, uh, a relatively deprived population, maybe up in Wigan, uh, you're going to have different outcomes from a younger and healthier population. But then there's the unwarranted variation, and that's the, the area that we're going to mine for quality improvement. So let's run through some examples of, of the sort of things we picked up. Here, here, here's a nice slide. Here, here's all the trusts plotted. On the x-axis, we've got length of stay after... Uh, male bladder outflow obstruction surgery, so TURP in old money, and that runs from 0 to 4 days. On the y-axis, we've got readmission rates running from 0 to 18% on that scale. And firstly, what you'll see there is actually keeping patients in longer does not reduce your readmission rate. It's a random uh, 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 pattern of distribution of those dots. And the other thing that we can gather is that if we go and talk to the departments that are in the bottom left-hand corner there with low lengths of stay, low readmission rates, we'll find that they have maybe adopted new technologies. They've maybe cut the umbilical cord of urology and decided that it's perfectly safe and sensible to send people home with catheters and not keep them in hospital for a trial without catheter. So I'm sure that we'll be able to migrate urological practice in a southwesterly direction and end up with far more trusts uh, with short lengths of stay and, and low readmission rates. Now, I think this is the most striking uh, slide in the pack, actually. This is renal colic, if you like. This is patients admitted as an emergency under the care of a urologist with a diagnosis of a urinary tract stone. So what do we do with those patients? Well, we intervene at an extraordinarily different rate of, of intervention levels. And here we've got what happens to people in terms of the procedures performed. So on the left-hand side, we've got people who have just a stent put in as their primary intervention. And you can see that's from 0 to 60-odd percent. The next is people who have definitive treatment with the ureteroscopy. Uh, the next one is nephrostomy, which we'll ignore. And then the next one is lithotripsy. So what's going on here? So, so if you have a lithotripter on site, you may offer acute lithotripsy, but if you have a lithotripter and it happens to be 10 miles away in another hospital, you certainly won't. Why not? Why is that such an impossible challenge? If you are taking a patient to theatre and you put in a stent, that's a GA, you're going to send the patient home, they'll have stent symptoms quite possibly, they'll return for a second general anaesthetic some weeks or months later. So why aren't we sorting them out at the first sitting so they go home stone-free if they do need an intervention. Well, we all know the reasons. We've got a patient, we've not got a surgeon. We've got a patient, we've got a surgeon, but we've got no operating theatre because the general surgeons are doing a laparotomy. We've got a patient, we've got a surgeon, we've got an operating theatre, but there's no laser plug in the operating theatre, so we can't do the case. Oh, no, it's all right. We've got a patient, we've got a surgeon, we've got a... Uh, an operating theatre, we've got a laser plug, but there's no technician to switch it on. So we still can't do the case and we put a stent up. Now, that's clearly not acceptable. It's not good enough. It's got to change. And that's where uh, this programme hopefully will trigger uh, a response. Uh, another area that, that, that I think crops up is, is the question of the failing department. So if we look at, at here we are, we've got 62-day cancer targets and the distribution of trusts around that target. And you can see most trusts 
hover around about the target, some doing a bit better, some doing a bit worse. But down at the bottom, there's a, a, a bundle of trusts there who are failing the target by a wide margin in the red and in the orange there. And some of those trusts are failing that target year after year after year, and yet nothing really changes, or, or there's been no history of change. So I think there is a need to recognize what, and try and work out what's going on in these departments. And I don't think it's usually rocket science, quite frankly. It may be external constraints, the hopeless capacity demand, mismatches, lack of operating theaters, and so on. Or it may be internal trust problems, so that the trust doesn't recognize they need more urologists. Or it may be the urology team itself, dysfunctional, not really coping with change, not really able to drive quality improvements. And I think those departments need particular targeted help to try and sort, them, uh, sort some of their problems out and move them forward. The next issue that I'd, I'd like to address, is, uh, which crops up in the report, is that of the urological workforce. And I'm going to pick up on two things, specialist nurses and consultants' involvement in, on core. So specialist nurses are now an absolutely integral part of the urology team. They are frontline members of the team. There are a lot of small departments that effectively run by consultants and specialist nurses with very few middle grade doctors. And we need large numbers of specialist nurses. And yet there's no structured training program and I didn't come across a single department which regards itself as a training department for specialist nurses. And you may wonder why. When you've got the specialist nurses, developed and built up uh, through ad hoc arrangements, then um, you've got grades doing different sorts of work. So you've got a highly skilled um, uh, group of nurses who may often be doing quite mundane tasks, cancer tracking, a simple administrative ta task, complete waste uh, of money. So I think we need to look at training, we need to look at how we're going to develop the, uh, the specialist nursing workforce going forward and how we're going to innovate. And there's a lot of innovation out there in terms of, uh, of this group of staff. And it's, it's very welcome and inspiring. We've got to make sure they're working at the right grade, so we're not wasting their talents. Uh, um, and we've got to make sure they're being properly trained. But we've also got to support them with the governance arrangements which are fit for purpose. And I worry that, that we really aren't quality assuring the work that specialist nurses are doing and providing them with the safety net of good governance arrangements uh, as a generalization. And finally, and very importantly, I think we're really missing a trick in many trusts in not establishing them in facilities which allow them to be maximally productive and to be very flexible in, in their throughput. And those uh, um, trusts with urological investigations units are able to really forge forward and make the most of this workforce and encourage the next generation as well. And, and there's a recommendation about developing UIUs. I promised something on consultant involvement in on-call work and you won't be disappointed. So what do we make of it all? Well, I think there is a clear expectation that, that consultants are going to be providing more hands-on input to acute urology than was historically the case. And across the country, this is really happening very quickly. And many departments are now running on, on a consultant of the week system. And I think that is a direction of travel which is, is inevitably going to be followed. It does involve consultants being able to target that work and do it properly. So it means re re reducing some or all, or all of their elective commitments in order to make space to do that work and lead the team. The flip side is, is, is that there's a lack of support for many on-call urologists. So if you don't have a middle grade doctor in urology and you're on call, you may get called out of bed at night uh, to do really minor interventions and then be expected to work the next day. And that's not a sustainable model. So I think trusts are being asked in the report to, to look at the workload of the on-call urologist and how they're going to be supported. Get the generic surgical team, not the general surgical team, the generic surgical team working and supporting the urologist as well as everybody else. Get specialist nurses or nurses trained up so that those nurses who are in the hospital at night can, can carry out some simple urological interventions. Networking, which we'll come on to in a moment, I think is also really important. And one way of, of rationalizing our use of consultants and of facilities is to ensure that we're not keeping too many urology departments open at weekends for acute care. And again, there's recommendations and discussion about that. And on a slightly different tack, 
there's a question which I think has lain dormant within urology, but it needs addressing, and that's the question of the skills gap for on-call uh, clinicians. So if you're a general urologist, if you're an endourologist, you won't have picked up a scalpel and done a major intra-abdominal operation quite often for many years, and yet you're on call and expected to rush to the obstetric theatre or the general surgical theatre to deal with some uh, extremely difficult bladder injury or ureteric injury. And we haven't addressed that, and I think that is leaving people exposed when they're on call, and it's leaving patients exposed as well. And we probably have to work out different protocols and systems for managing those uh, problems. So again, work that needs to be progressed. MDTs, a topical, there was a fantastic session this morning on MDT working, and it, it actually just, it, it really followed very much the, the ideas that, that, um, that are present in the GERFT report. These are an expensive resource, and it, it is ridiculous that we see them sometimes regarded as a way of double reporting investigations. We're short of radiologists, we're so, short of histopathologists, so why do we have double reporting of investigations? Do it correctly the first time, and then uh, that should be sufficient. Duplication of investigations is even worse. You may be inflicting unnecessary cystoscopies on patients, and we certainly came across reports where that was happening because of poor linkage between feeder and uh, provider trusts. I'm not sure MDTs have really done a great job in protecting the interests of patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer. We don't have proof, but there's certainly a strong suspicion that the 62-day target for bladder cancer has left some patients stranded as having their TURBT on, day, uh, TURBT on day 61 and then really less attention paid as their muscle-invasive bladder cancer is still with them up to the time of definitive treatment. And we certainly need more data on that to reassure us. The data from GERFT was anything but reassuring. And there's also the question as to whether MDTs are really delivering the degree of uniformity of care which was expected of them when they were set up. And we see that to some extent with prostate cancer, and we particularly saw it in relation to partial nephrectomy. And on this slide, what we've got is um, nephrectomies by trusts, and firstly, you'll see an extraordinary distribution of volumes across the, the piece, so quite a long tail of relatively small numbers being carried out in quite a few trusts. But I think of, of more importance and more interest is the proportion of red bars, which are partial nephrectomies, compared with yellow and blue bars, which are complete nephrectomies, either radical or simple. And there you'll see that MDTs are producing clearly very different decision-making decision processes uh, as the, ver the proportion of partial nephrectomies varies massively between virtually zero and 50%. So MDTs are not delivering a great uniformity of care. So, one of, I think, the most ambitious outputs of, of the Getting It Right First Time review is the idea that we should be thinking about urology area networks as the unit of urology service delivery. And it comes from a very basic question, which is, what population do you need to set up a urology service which uh, can be comprehensive and rational and efficient in use of resources? And what, what I clearly found as you travel around the country is that what, what you're going to do in Manchester or the West Yorkshire conurbation is going to be quite different from what you're going to do in Scarborough, Hull, Lincolnshire, um, uh, and so on. So that there's no one-size-fits-all here. But there is a need for collaboration. So I'd define a urology area network as a collaborative arrangement between probably two or three trusts uh, that allows them to address some of the issues in service delivery which we're facing at the moment. So that would be trying to rationalise emergency care, as I said, making sure we're not keeping too many departments open, uh, for example, at weekends when they're quiet, making good use of our, our resources and resolving some of those problems I've just mentioned. I think we need really seamless subspecialist care. So at the moment it's very disjointed, it's very ad hoc, there are strange referral pathways often based on personal uh, relation, relationships between uh, the specialists and, uh, and their uh, and the clinicians in outlying hospitals. And that's, it's, it's very unjoined up. It's not really well developed with protocols in andrology, neurological urology, and so on. And I think thinking in network terms will improve that. 
It's also about balancing networks. What is the point of being a retention patient in a major cancer uh, centre that will never treat you or treat you at a very late, late date? So the, there's a need to move work across a network to make best use of resources and ensure that patients are being treated sensibly and appropriately. And I put in, as a controversial statement, why does... Why do all the, the standard laparoscopic nephrectomies need to be done in the center, which is doing the complex open cases and the robotic partials? Can that workload move, move out, for example? And I think it's also very much about ensuring the sustainability of urology departments moving forward. I think there are a, quite a number of smaller departments which are on the very edge of sustainability. And I think network arrangements should keep those departments open, maybe in a different form, uh, but ensuring that, that, that patients are getting care uh, close to home and access to general urological services of a high quality, uh, which isn't a million miles away. We also make a recommendation about patient numbers. And I did this with, with difficulty because there isn't actually a lot of evidence out there, but I'll give you two bits of evidence. And one is that we know very clearly across lots of specialties, lots of procedures, that very low volume complex surgery doesn't work, either at a surgeon or an institutional level, and results are less good. But looking at the data that I see coming across in the funnel plots from GERFT, I see really very little relationship between any of the outcome measures and volume that are being delivered by trusts. And I was very struck by this slide, which uh, kind of has been provided by the National Prostate Cancer Audit. And there we're looking at outcomes, patient reported outcomes. The bottom right is for sexual function, top left is urinary incontinence. And really, there doesn't look to be a big relationship there between volume and outcome. And what that says to me is that if we are driving quality improvement, and if we think that centralizing work alone is going to deliver great improvements, then I think we're going to be sadly mistaken. So I think we, we need to be thoughtful about that and really understand a lot more about the volume outcome relationship before driving that into policy. So I think in order to get networks off the ground, I think that they need, we need a, a national model which makes sense so that every department is clearly identified within a network and the boundary disputes which have been difficult in some areas with cancer care are uh, perhaps less of an obstruction to implementation. And so a cohesive rational national blueprint is something that I'm very keen to see. And I think networks need to develop on a framework. You can't just say, look, go and work together. I think we've got to have some guidance and some, some, some support for that process. And I think one way of doing that is actually to put together a comprehensive service description document, which really sets down in black and white how the pathways are going to work, who's taking a lead in this, who's taking a lead in that, how you're going to stop patients having stents put in instead of a definitive stone treatment. And I think that could be quite a, a strong tool. So I'm going to finish with two, two quick areas. Firstly, equipment procurement, and there are some extraordinary tools out there now to look at, at the, uh, the way that we're procuring um, the equipment and kit that we're using. So here we go. This is some data on the use of, this is national data, on the use of ureteric stents. Well, we're buying our stents from 20 different suppliers. And there are 36 brands of ureteric stent. Now, I'm not an endourologist, and I might be wrong, but I suspect that we could probably manage with fewer, uh, with less variation. And we're spending approaching three million pounds on that. So let's look at, a, at a, and that applies to all of those bits of disposable equipment. So let's have a look at, at, at the costs per trust. So on this chart, what we've got is, is the highest volume uh, spend, on, or the highest volume brand and the cost per trust. So the red line is showing you that uh, there are some trusts that, that, are, that their highest high volume stent, they're spending 80 pounds. And there are some trusts at the bottom end there who are spending 40 pounds. Now the blue bars are the total spend by trust. And what you'll notice there, on a trust by trust basis, there's no relationship between volume and cost. So it's not that the big, big high volume centers are getting big discounts. It's a random process. So there's something about procurement, and I think there's a, a responsibility on us all to get involved in looking at, uh, at the costs and expenditure on stuff and helping our procured, procurement departments make sensible and rational buying decisions based on our knowledge of, of the products that we're buying. And I think that we can drive down 
costs without any loss of quality there. And I'm going to finish with litigation because I think it's fascinating. So if we look at the volumes of, of claims, so this is data from NHS Resolution, and what they've done is to, to aggregate the cost of claims against urologists or, um, uh, or, or, or claims with a urology uh, tag on them. And they, they, these are either costs that have been paid out or potential estimated costs. And we can see that the number of claims there between 2012, 2013, and 2016, 17 has gone up from 223 to, two, uh, to 348. And the cost attached to that has doubled in that time frame. So it's now standing at, at, at 33 million pounds a year. So again, let's move on to the variation behind that. And I think that's not a graph that you'd expect to see. So if we divide each trust's litigation exposure against the volume of work they do as judged by admissions, urology admissions, you can see that the average cost of a litigation procedure it equates to something like £38 per admission. But in that right-hand quadrant, we really do need to understand what's gone on there because there are some really high costs there. And we see the same with obstetrics. We see the same with orthopedics. So is it that those trusts with high exposures have had one super expensive claim which has paid out millions? Or is there a systematic problem in that trust with the way they're delivering care? Or is it a, a rogue individual uh, with a practice which is creating mayhem. And we need to get behind that and understand it and bring down those costs. So, to finish with then, what would I say about, about the experience with GERFT? Well, I think it has been an extraordinary initiative, such a simple idea, and yet it, it's become, certainly in, uh, from my experience, the most clinically engaged major quality initiative uh, that the NHS has probably ever run. It's got a methodology which seems to work for surgical specialties, and we're going to wait with interest to see how it applies to medical specialties and indeed now to general practice. There is tremendous credibility at the moment, both politically, so this is something that is the number one quality initiative at present in the Department of Health, uh, but also I think it's still got professional credibility, and I appreciate the support that, that Baus has given, that Baun has given, and that you individually have given to the, to the program. But I think we're now on that crucial tipping point, aren't we? I, I, I well remember the 2002 report on integrated con uh, continent services, that, which was the definitive report on how to make an excellent continent service. And you could wheel out that report now and represent it, and it would seem to answer all of our questions today. And it's sat on the shelf for 16 years and has not been listened to. Is the same going to happen with GERF? Well, there are measures in place to try and stop that happening. And that comes from the top-down interest within the NHS in the programme. There's also implementation teams out in all the regions which are trying to make it happen. And there are plans for it to be a rolling programme of quality improvement supported by ever-improving data acquisition and continuing and strong professional input. So I think it's got a future. I think the next year is going to be fascinating. And as they say in the House of Commons, I commend this report to the House. Thank you very much. Simon, mean, thank you very much. That was an excellent talk and a, and a fabulous insight into a very impressive uh, piece of work and impressive document. I would also urge you all to read it. I think we, we, we are running out of time, but uh, we'll probably have time for a question or two if there's anything from the audience or like me, do you just feel like you need to go away, read it again, and um, figure out how you can implement it locally, or help to implement it? Nothing? Um, Simon, from your perspective, what, what is next for GERFT? Is it literally just a case now of everyone go, go back to try and implement things? And... Well, there are two things. One is that I hope that clinicians and, and teams will get some, in, some inspiration and thoughts from it as to how they can start to do things better, particularly knowing that around the country there are so many examples of excellent practice and, and, and trying to realise that, that, that there's so much good stuff going on which can be replicated across the country. So I think there is, there is an imperative that people take stuff on. But there's also a checklist from the recommendations going through of who needs to do what to move each individual thing forward. And 
already there have been st the stuff going on. So I've had discussions with people from NHS England about some of the cancer stuff, and we need to, to tie that in. We've had meetings with the MSIT team and BAUS about data uh, improvements and so on. So there is a checklist uh, uh, of uh, measures that need to be taken and, and, and an element of, of program management in there. Great. Simon, thank you very much once again. Much appreciated. Um, we now have a refreshment break for 15 minutes. Please do visit the stands um, and University Challenge is back in here at about quarter past four. Thank you. In so